what is it gonna be? Um, I'm not sure if it's good or is it bad, but there will be three talks about patterns today. Usually we say if we have nothing about to argue, as a developers, we speak about patterns. So most probably we have nothing to speak about in Angular, but let's try to do this. Uh, as you could heard from presentation, I'm Valor Software CTO. Working there, my main activity is code reviewing, interviewing new people, mentoring my developers, tweeting a lot, reading tweets, Twitter, Twitter, and a bit of open source development on NGX Bootstrap. From these perspectives, you can see, I would say, patterns of uh, human nature. So issues guys reporting to open source projects, modules, and what they do in their code while I'm reviewing their code is mainly the same. And they came from not understanding how the things really works. So for example, simple question, which tool do you use most of all at your work? WebStorm, wake up, Visual Studio Code, OK, I am in the lesser part. But in my opinion, most the most powerful tool, and hopefully you cannot work or code without it, is your brains, your imagination. I believe somebody can code without it, but I cannot. So let's try to load several recognition patterns to your brain. Doing interviews a lot. I uh, have figured out some statistics about which patterns are most known or which does not. For example, let's try singletons, who knows? A lot. Factories, a lot. PubSub, lesser. Adapter, even lesser. That's fine. Not fine at all. A new button. So, dependency injection. Oh my god, wrong room uh, module, a wrong room at all. And version of control. Come on, guys, you, you don't know it. <laughs> what I'm doing here? Secures, sounds good. So <laughs> I have something to speak about it. But question is, if you was writing Angular, I see that you know what you are doing. You have wrote something like this, similar to this code. And you actually was using dependency injection. But question is, you know the definition, you know how it works, you know implementation of this pattern for current framework you use. But question is, what is intent of this pattern? What was it created for? What kind of problems it solves? Who knows? Lesser. Awesome. Let's speak about it. My favorite part about any pattern, especially for those who read GetGo4, is their description, because it makes a lot of sense to me each time I read it. Dependency injection is a technique whereby one object supplies the dependencies of another object. Imagine yourself a trainee or junior developer who will say, like, read the patterns and then understand them. Will it help you a lot? Not really, I suppose. Their approach uh, to explaining the patterns, which was proposed already almost 10 years ago. Imagine you explain a pattern as a f to five years old boy or girl, whatever. Imagine home alone and he wants to eat and drink something. He goes to the refrigerator and this is where the funny part starts. He can get uh, outdated food, beer, and left refrigerator open, because he has drunk already. And this is completely not the case we want to achieve. So kid just want to eat something. What he really needs is to go to his injectors and ask for food and to drink some. And then he will get an expected result. But from internets, but you know that internet never lies, um, there are a lot of articles at some point that 
Do we really need a dependency injection? Dependency injection is overkill for Angular, and so on, so on, and so on. But let's imagine our code without dependency injection. Simple, simple scenario. You need to display a user list, correct? So you will create a user service, which needs HTTP service, which apparently needs to know URL from config where to get this user list. And then you need to, what you need to do? You need to grab config, then you need to grab HTTP service, create a new instance of HTTP service, put there a config, grab user service, put there a HTTP service instance, create new one, go to the user component, provide this user service. I cannot even pronounce all this. And then you will be able to load your user list. Does it worth it? No, not at all. Dependency injection intention is to solve this pain, one of the intentions. So what you really want is a user service. You don't really care about dependencies of user service on its own. So idea of inversion of control is that you are giving away this power to create instances and just provide you already created instance of this class you want to work with. And uh, common sense. Now you got the idea. Dependency injection, what it was for, an intention, but you don't have a feeling when to use it or when to not use it at all. Imagine you go into the restaurant and you want to eat carbonara. You say, asking the waiter to come in and like, okay, please go to the kitchen, upstairs to the left, uh, grab some water, boil it, then grab uh, spaghetti, boil it, uh, grab egg, then you need cheese, shaved cheese, then you need to put spaghetti, uh, macaroni, spaghetti, cheese, egg, whatever. Imagine the situation, each day you go into the restaurant, same way to the same waiter, and asking him to create all the stuff. This is what guys are doing without dependency injection, because they have to know each step, where to get, what to get, how to create, so they're repeating this recipe each time. Or, in a common sense, you go into the restaurant and say, like, I want to eat carbonara. Do you have a feeling of difference between approaches? But edge cases of understanding and where guys fail usually is on the edge between patterns. So let's speak about module pattern a bit. If you was writing a common GS, you was writing requires, model experts, or you are using fancy ECMAScript 6 standard with importing experts. So you know what model pattern is because you use it daily. But let's see about a bit of history. Immediately invoked function expressions. This is how Modulus was working for JavaScript for the last maybe 20 years. But we are fancy now. We're using Webpack, TypeScript, all that stuff, ECMAScript stuff. This is typical, uh, typical sample of the model. And this is how Bootstrap, JS, or jQuery plugins was developed mainly to import and mix in additional plugins to it. But the question is, do you think this EFE, um, invoca in immediately invoked function expression stuff, does it really r relate to current web? Are we using it, or we have ECMAScript 6 modules and bundles on the stuff? Do we, should we know how it works internally? What do you think? Should we? Or not? OK. Sleeping again. Need a joke. If you will look inside of Node.js, and we'll see how it goes inside of it. Each file will be wrapped inside of the function, which will grab module and require and some other global stuff and push to your file. So inside of your file, you can require or export stuff. If you take a look on your Webpack bundles, so anyway, uh, ECMAScript standard is a standard only for a year. So as a front-end developers, we should understand that next five or six years, we will have to bundle and transpile to ECMAScript 5. This is how Webpack bundles look inside. 
So basically, we are still using same immediately invocation function expression even now. What it gives to us as a model pattern? It gives us namespacing, what it means. Our functions on private stuff is not leaking to the global space. On the other hand, we can choose which methods and properties we can or should export to the outside. It gives us an encapsulation, hide it our implementation from outside. It allows us to structure code, because we split in different modules, and then we work with modules, not just going somewhere to direct place. We require an, a module and working with it. And of course, managing dependencies, because module ID is what it's all about. But it appears that module pattern itself is a particular implementation of module concept for languages which does not support modules, like JavaScript. An idea of module concept is simply to structure your code in a components which accomplish a particular function or contain everything necessary to accomplish a particular task. Yeah, yes, I just needed a uh, funny picture up here to bring you back to the attention. Because I know that theoretical mat materials, that, you know, all these patterns, it's, it's just everybody goes to sleep. And now let's take a look on ng module. From the name, it seems that it is a module pattern. But it is not only it. What you really do with ng module, you are configuring Angular dependency injection. Engine. This is what you're really doing. You gathering all things needed, all parts, to have a component which contains everything you need to accomplish some kind of a feature. And what kind of things it allows us? Imagine empty file, and then you're writing down their function declaration. You have a file, it's a model, you have function declaration, it's obvious, common sense, that this function is not available from a different file. Exactly. Until you will export it from the first file. Same applies to ng-model. Until you exported your component, even if it's declared inside of, it's not visible, because it's needed for this particular module to be able to perform particular task. That's simple. When you want to use some kind of function from different file, what you do? You import that function from that file. This what for imports works. And a bit different situation with providers. Declarations, imports, exports, they have a local visibility. What I mean? If you have ng model, your declarations are visible only inside of this model. But if you have a providers inside of it, and you will use this ng model somewhere else, those providers will be visible too. So declarations, local scope to module until they export it, and providers are globally scope. Oh my god, this button look kind of crazy. No, no, please. Just continue. So Thanks God, we get to the typical problems we have. At some point of application development, you will want to create a shared model. If to search uh, by GitHub Angular shared model, you will see a lot of issues like, I'm importing this shared model, but you know that component does not work for me. So I suppose I don't, don't have to already explain why it does not, or should I? So if components was not exported, they will not will be available from a shared component. So you need to export stuff. More of it, when you're creating a shared module, we have two options for visibility. One for providers, it's global. So it makes sense to have two shared modules, one for providers and import it to the application route because it will be available everywhere. And one other for uh, components. 
because they have a local visibility. So it means you will have to import it in any lazy loaded module, for example, or any child module. Other part, so if shared was components from child model, you importing stuff. Lazy loaded modules and problems related to them is about my model was imported. And in parent components, there are some components I want to use. And they will not be al available in the child for the same reason. Let's abstract from ng model. Let's for something simpler. You have a file, one file, and you have a function declaration with export. From this file, you import in another file. And you're planning to use this function from second file without import. That's fine? I suppose no. Same applies to ng models. Until you export this function to the third file and import this function to both of them, it does not feel natural to use it. But it's still fine for lazy loaded, like the right component, I should be able to use it. No, it doesn't. Rules about local visibility for components applies to common GS, to ECMAScript 6, and to Angular modules in the same way. And other interesting thing is when you have a lot of developers working in different teams in parallel on different parts of your application. And you can get easily in a situation where you have a services with the same name. More of it when you use open source uh, libraries, you can import several of them, and they easily could have services with the same name. And the thing is, the last one wins. Who was imported as the last service will be used for everybody. And one more thing which goes out of attention. When you configure and test in module for some reason, no one really treats it as a module. Everybody is expected to just work. But it has to be uh, declared and work in the same way as any other module you do. Absolutely the same, because it has to contain everything required to accomplish a particular feature. On some hand, you can see that there are, you can import in test configuration that initial module, because it already contains everything, so you can use it here. But it appears so that you should not, because your test eventually will get much, much slower. And almost the last, but not least. One more typical question is that, you know, guys, I have a um, Ray user list. And in AngularJS, it was working just fine. So I was you know, pushing additional items, additional users, was changing the name of the user in place. And it was working fine. But now we upgraded our application to just Angular, and it stopped to work for some reason. Who knows why it stopped to work? So have you guys was working with AngularJS previously? And you upgraded eventually to just Angular? Hopefully not, not everybody's so lucky. I'm so sorry. OK. For those guys who will be upgrading, you should know that uh, we'll take a look a bit on JS memory nodes, so it will be easier to get while it's stopped to work, or will stop to work. When you're defining an object, you're actually defining a property in local scope, which will go to the data stack, and you're allocating memory in memory heap. And you only have white reference types, your local property has only a reference to that object. When you change in, like for example, you had a user in array and you change its name, object reference did not change. But property inside of this object in memory heap did change. What you need to actually do to up update this reference to an object, you need to create a new object, your captain. So it will allocate it will allocate a new memory in memory heap and will upgrade reference in your local property to it. And the dirty word for dirty checking. 
how it was working. You have your application, you have your HTML or your properties, components, and all the stuff. It has a name, it's scoped. There are application state, all the hierarchy, all the tree, it's a state. And AngularJS, in a way, in order to find a difference to upgrade your view, to re-render it, was cloning previous state, deeply cloning. So it was cloning all properties or ob memory heap objects. So it was a huge memory hit each time something happens, like user clicks a button. So it needs to analyze again. And it, it again copies all your state. And then it has previous state and your current state, and deeply comparing what actually did changed. Then it finds out the root where it was changing and re-rendering the application, and then cloning again all the state. This is why AngularJS was so slow, or not so slow, but eventually. Just Angular said that just enough. Just imagine an application which has a lot of elements, like 1,000, and you need to clone all this stuff and then deep compare each time user clicks. It's incredible. It's performance heat, it's memory heap. We will not do this. We will not go into the memory heap. We will be using strict equality to find out which properties, what is actually changed. So it still kind of has previous state, but it does not clone the state. It has previous value for your inputs and outputs fields. And then when you change the property of a user, so for example, upgrading the name of the user, yes, up there something changed. But change detection engine works from up to down. So first of all, it will look for a reference to array of users. If reference to array of users did not check, it will not change. It will not go to the user and will not go to the username. So in order to say instruct engine change detection, so you should go to that name. You have to update the reference to array. So basically recreate it. You have to recreate one object, not necessary to update all objects. You need to recreate one object. And then it will go to this path and it will find out that the name actually changed. And we will render only this part. Immutability, immutability principle to the rescue. I suppose everybody knows, but still again, I love this principle. If you have an object and some property of this object had changed, it should be actually new object created. That simple. This is what makes it work. But don't forget, each button has disadvantages and advantages. Let's take a look on small piece of code. I will give you a sec to read it through. Is it valid or should we change it? Who thinks that code is valid completely? That's fine. Let's leave it alone. Or who thinks we need to change it, it a bit? after code review. Who is for change? Who is for, it's good enough, it just works, then touched. It happens. Let's go through and take a look. There are some patterns, like single responsibility. What does it mean? You have a something, for example, small scope function. You had one job to do. This is about it. There are a chain of responsibilities which actually just means that you can chain function calls to achieve something. And there are a pattern which says like par functions. I love the description of par functions too, like avoid side effects. What is side effects, really? Uh, let's say that par functions is a functions which works only with params they get. They change them and they give it back. Not changing params, not changing the outer scope, just work what you have got. And strategy pattern is pretty simple that if you have ifs, basically you have different roles, you will create a branches of application execution. Just do them and move your work with the different trees of your application in separate functions who is responsible for it. 
and my code review comments. Yeah, annoying guy, I know. So the third thing you can notice is that it's not single responsibility. It does all the job in one place. On the other hand, it could be chained. Exactly. And then you have an if. Possibly you can use a strategy pattern. And then you can see that there are slow array operation, like users push. And at the bottom, you can see that there are side effects. That's really common in uh, Angular application who use RxJS. You actually do an asynchronous, asynchronous request to the backend, and you get those users list. And then you store in this users list in synchronous property of your service, which actually available to any part of your application, global visibility, remember. So at some place, you did call this. And other place, you're expecting that this property of service will contain the user list. And here we go. We have race condition issues. And you'll have funny time to find where it's actually broken. Who is responsible to fill this in? And of course, observable suit better as a cold one. Applying these simple patterns, you will get much lesser code and much better re readability. Because you should remember that whatever you write, whatever code piece of software you produce, you actually produce it for humans. Should, it should be simple, readable, and understandable. <sighs> to sum up, I know theory is uh, really annoying. Reading about patterns, reading about principles, it could going to sleep anybody. But there are good books that describes not contains not only description and code samples. Each pattern was created, as some guy says, written by, devel by developers' blood. They are intended to solve some kind of issue. There are use cases like intention of a pattern itself, what kind of problem it will solve. So you should find it. You have a Google. You should read it and feel it. Because when you write in a code, you actually a creation process. You're using your feelings to see, is it bad code? Is it good code? You does not really get it like, OK, this is a bad pattern, this is a pattern. No, you have a feeling about code. When you start to feel the patterns, it will be easier to you to apply them or not. Don't overuse, because each pattern has advantages and disadvantages, which will lead you to interesting issues. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Have a nice day.